allow me then uh, on more direct of ceremonies to begin by expressing on behalf of our government, our cabinet and our people, our deepest sympathy on the passing of Dr. Theo Benguera, a great comrade and leader of Namibia and the African continent. We share in your loss and we are partners with you in remembering the road he traveled and the contribution made both to Namibia but to our region and the African continent broadly. Let me begin my lecture then. Now, I'm one who's not known to be nervous, but there have been so many speakers, and I thought we were just coming to a small little occasion. So to be in a room with two presidents, several ministers, ambassadors, and students, although they're much nicer students than some of ours, <laughs> it's really quite something. So uh, I'm really, really grateful to be here. I first heard of Professor Juma in 2010, soon after I was appointed Minister of Science and Technology. I received an email in March 2010 that he had written to a staff member in the office of the presidency. The letter went as follows. I'm writing to, to inquire if the president of Africa's most powerful science nation has a science and technology advisor. If not, please forward this letter to the right person in the office of the president so that remedial action can be taken expeditiously. <laughs> I believe, he continued, that South Africa should continue to serve as a role model for the rest of the continent on the importance of science and technology. It is for this reason that South Africa's president should have a science and technology advisor. If there are reasons not to have such a position, then I would like to have the opportunity to meet the president to discuss the matter with him. I would like to come accompanied by Professor Mohammed Hassan, President of the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, and Dr. Shem Arumbo Olende, President of the African Academy of Sciences. He concluded, if such an advisor exists, please do connect with to him or her, and consider the contents of this email meeting. Best regards, Kalestos Juma, PhD, FRS, NAS, TWAS, African Academy of Sciences, Professor of the Practice of International Development, Harvard Kennedy School. Well, I suppose the president's office sent that letter to me to respond. At the time when I read it, I thought, hmm, this professor's being a little presumptuous. But I see from his unfinished draft for Namibia on science advice that he continued to believe that was genuine in his belief in the importance of presidential science advisors. I came to know him better after we met at President Obama's U.S.-Africa Summit in 2015 and through his subsequent advisory role in the development of the Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy for Africa, or STEFA. And I am still immensely attracted to three of his key concerns about which he wrote so much. He argued that the bioeconomy would transform African agriculture. He wanted African universities be invented and diversified. And thirdly, he was keen on the humanities and social sciences 
and in favor of encouragement. Now, what do we know about Africa and science, as well as innovation in the community? We don't, as Africans, devote a lot of time to deliberate on science and its potential contribution to development on our continent. But here are some of the facts. Africa, our home, is home to 15% of the world's population and produces 5% of the world's gross domestic product. But it accounts for only 1.3% of the globe's investment in research and development. Africa also holds only 0.1% of the world's patents. These are scary statistics, because if we hold only 0.1% of world patents, it means we are producing the least knowledge in the world, and it's scary. Why? We are relying on others to produce knowledge about us. However, Despite these dismal statistics, a recent World Bank report reveals that there has been a significant growth in sub-Saharan research in Africa, but notes that inter-African research links are rare. In fact, just last week, a famous South African, uh, African academic, Professor Zeleza, has just published a very important paper on higher education in Africa. And he has looked at our research productivity in that paper, and he indicates that we have become better at publishing with colleagues in other parts of the world, which is a good sign, but we are not publishing with each other. Half of the research that has been identified in the World Bank report indicates that over 50% of our productivity is in the health sciences. There is, very clearly, as the World Bank uh, report reveals, quite a significant scientific base on the African continent. But it also indicates that we have work to do in training and strengthening our African research relationships. Our aim as Africa has to be to transform science, technology, and innovation on the African continent. It is impossible for us to thrive in isolation. We have to become part of an African research and innovation system. And we've got to be serious about this. We cannot be satisfied contributing 0.1% of patents. We can't pat ourselves on the back producing 1.3% of research. But pleasingly, more and more African researchers are broadening their horizons and engaging in much needed uh, projects in food security, in energy, in transport, and in health research, particularly research in malaria and HIV. So we have begun to see the number of papers from African researchers almost double in just over a decade. And that's great, but the road we have to catch up is such a long one. But I've been pleased to see reports that there's improvement in quantity, there's improvement in quality, and the international citations according to data from Scobus, indicates that it is a significant improvement. Scobus is the largest database of peer-reviewed literature. And if your literature is peer-reviewed, then it means other colleagues have recognized you as being important work. 
we are seeing more and more funding for African research. This includes the Grand Challenges Africa Grants, $7 million in grants over the next five years for scientific breakthroughs in maternal health care and precision medicine in Africa. We have the Kwame Nkrumah Scientific Award from the African Union, $100,000 to top, South to top African scientists who provide innovations in life and earth science. The next Einstein Fellowship, which recognizes Africa's distinguished scientists under the age of 42. Neil Turok, the founder of the next Einstein Initiative, tweeted recently, when Africans enter science in large numbers, with their diversity, backgrounds, and motivation, they will make massive, transformative discoveries. Those discoveries are just waiting there to be made, concluded. The African Academy of Sciences is part of this drive and is doing sterling work to build intra-African research and development partnerships. The African Academy's Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa is currently managing $100 million developing excellence in leadership, training, and science for the Delta's Africa program. These initiatives create a human resource pipeline that can sustain this area of research work into the future, and which can help us contribute to the availability of a critical mass of globally competitive African health scientists. The issue of critical mass is important because we tend to operate on the basis of fairly modest numbers but small numbers of PhDs don't give you critical mass. You need to exponentially grow the number in order for the impact to actually occur. So this issue of critical mass must not uh, escape us. Our continent needs highly capable African scholars. We need African research leaders able to hold their own in a global environment, just as the late <laughs> Professor Juma put. We already have some of these scientists, but we need so many thousands more. We need to strengthen and build on the initiatives I've made reference to, and many others, to ensure a robust and sustainable research and innovation sector in all African countries. Increased attention must be given to finding resources to increase our research focus beyond agriculture and health. Young researchers have a wide range of fields of interest. We have to support them to explore a diversity of disciplines. Now, young people, as they look at us here, will probably see all of us are quite aging, and it is vital that you devote attention to becoming academics and scholars, because a lot of you think the best place to be is in a bank, earning a whole lot of money, but you're not producing knowledge for the continent. We need researchers, we need academics, we need professors. And it's only from your ranks that those people can come. So as you talk, as they do in our country, about decolonization <coughs> of higher education, remember that the colonizer cannot be a decolonizer. And so you've got to be the new academic who is Science report made some very fascinating 
it indicated that there has been a positive shift in research development and innovation. The report shows the success of the African Union's first African science, technology, and innovation plan of action. Recently, the African Union adopted its second Africa plan. It prioritizes science to drive economic and social development across the continent. It commits signatory countries to six key goals. These include tackling hunger, disease, and unemployment, and it indicates that structures will be set up to pursue those goals. Now, I'm sure gathered in this room, since I believe many of you are students of science, we all know that breakthrough or frontier science, as they call it, takes a long time, and that breakthroughs are immensely difficult to predict. <coughs> All that the task is about is getting the right balance between funding basic or frontier science and focusing on particular fields of science in which we know that we want to grow the industries. It is for this distinction that our country, South Africa, has made such a strong investment in astronomy. This is why we have made such a strong investment in space science. This is why we are investing more in biotechnology and nanotechnology. Well, we fully appreciate, as Professor Juma did, that we cannot do any of this, these things without the best evidence-based advice available. So, what are some of the things we've done in South Africa to address these gaps, as well as in our republic here in the near future? A decade ago, our innovation system faced three major challenges. Firstly, there was a tension between the different policy processes followed in higher education and in science and technology. The two operated very separately and distinctly. Second, it seemed to many that science and technology department targeted strategic and applied research at the expense of basic research. So now the problem here is, if you focus solely on solving problems on applied science, and you neglect mathematics, biology, physics, you do not have the foundation to continue the kind of focus that you want. And so it shouldn't be a competition between applied research and basic research. And often we have that in our systems. Uh, even when you uh, do reviews in your systems, you'll find all of us are talking about innovation. All of us, everybody. But then when you look at what people are studying, you find that we've forgotten we need chemistry, we need geology, we need mathematics, we need physics, we need life science. All the sites are the window to application. The third then problem was it was apparent that we had failed to increase research output and to develop black and women researchers. Mr. President, what I've done in, in this little talk. I've tried to imagine what Professor Juma would want to tell us about what we might need to think of doing. So, in terms of then that human resource aspect, what these three problems showed 
was that as South Africa at that time, we were still locked into the pre-1994 research patterns and practices with a few elite institutions producing the majority of the research output. So what we had done was we allowed the apartheid framework we inherited to die. However, over the last decade, there has been much improvement on these three challenges to our innovation system. Research output has improved, and I think in terms of scopus, spectacularly in some fields like astronomy and environment sciences. The number of science, engineering, and technology graduates has increased, not as impressively as required, but the number of PhDs certainly has, with a milestone of more black than white PhD graduates reached in 2015. But our innovation system still has to find the best approach Some of our colleagues do say that the Department of Science and Technology still tends to be mission-oriented, often at the expense of basic research. It is probably true that we have concentrated research in a few areas, what we have called geographic and knowledge advantage areas, what we have called grand challenge. And certainly our premier uh, focus on astronomy, which is for us both a grand challenge area as well as a geographic diaspora and research intensive institutions on the continent. So what we've tried to do is we We also invest in the enablers that we have put in place to turn scientific research into technology. So this is why we invest in our country in centers of excellence, in research chairs, and in national research facilities. Because we must create an ecosystem for research and innovation. Ooh. Otherwise, it's a bit there. The greatest challenge I think we face uh, as a continent is in providing exciting opportunities to our young people. It's clear that perhaps we can utilize high technology innovations to help us grow employment over the long term. Because as new technology spreads from one sector to adjacent sectors and so on, throughout the economy, we can support uh, a growth. But it's also clear that emerging high technology sectors by themselves don't employ more people at the moment. Innovation works through the creative construction of the future. However, the future lies in the emergence of the vast field of artificial intelligence. And that's what we've begun to focus on. So let me illustrate briefly through the Square Kilometer Array. I've spent a great deal of time with the Square Kilometer Array, and Namibia is one of the partner countries on the continent. And I've developed a deep appreciation of its importance. I still remember when a scientist in the United States asked me, Minister Pandel, why are you not focusing on food security and agriculture? What are you doing with astronomy sciences? I was a bit of a novice minister then. I couldn't quite answer. And when I met her a few years later, I was able to give her a brilliant <laughs> So, what I was able to say was, on one hand, Big science infrastructure projects like the Square Kilometer Array tend to have 
unexpected twins. Certainly it's a radio telescope, but it's also an information technology project of the kind that pushes the boundaries of global technology. Big tech companies <coughs> can become involved in this astronomy project because they know it will allow them to develop the knowledge and technologies that will keep them at the leading edge of computing. Actually, this radio telescope is a big computing problem. <coughs> On the other hand, what could be more important than seeking a better understanding of the origins, how the universe was formed, how galaxies and stars are formed? Astronomy is a discipline that gives context to our place in the universe and a framework for how we see the world. Construction of the Square Kilometer Array Phase 1 <coughs> is set to start in 2018 with early science observations in 2020, producing the thousands of dishes required for the SKA within the project's timescales will also demand an entirely new way of building highly sophisticated and sensitive scientific instruments, which should lead innovations in manufacturing and construction. Now, when Minister of Higher Education and Research in Namibia starts to ask the Parliament for money for this initiative, they will fight with you, ministers. They won't understand. <laughs> and then when they see all the global IT companies coming into the country, when they see the construction opportunities, you become the most popular minister. <laughs> <laughs> the completion and unveiling last week of the South African demonstrator contribution to the SKA, the 64 dish meerkat, was one of the crowning moments of my I believe that our continent has begun to make a major investment in the future through the Square Kilometer Array. It will be the first time as Africa that we host global research infrastructure. <laughs> global research infrastructure projects play an invaluable, believe it one day when I go to the small aeroplane to Kimberley. And the gentleman in the seat next to me said, Good evening, Mr. SKA. <laughs> oh, <laughs> realize the public is watching and interested. So there exists then a crucial interface between the global development of science and international development. This interface is most acute in developing countries whose national development imperatives strongly informed and underpinned by science, technology, and innovation. So in addition to these interests in science control areas, Professor Juma also had a broader interest in encouraging evidence-based policy development along the lines of the work being done through institutions such as In February 2016, we were privileged to host the Inter-Academy Partnership Conference on Science at Once, which considered the importance of science in policy making across various areas, such as climate change, urbanization, disasters, deadly virus monitoring, or emergency responses on emergencies that concern society. Scientists have a huge responsibility to ensure that scientific debates are informed by solid scientific evidence, by logical argument, by reasoning, and by sound advice. It was argued by some in that science advisors meeting that science advice should be viewed as a component of science diplomacy. Sir Peter Gluck, a science advisor to the New Zealand government, 
Prime Minister, has been the leading light in spelling out the importance of science and maths. His view is that policy is barely determined by science alone, but that policy can be informed by evidence. One of my worries in our parliaments and countries tend to brainstorm policy. We don't think it We don't use evidence-based policy making very well. And that's why we do have quite significant problems implementing the policies that we develop. If we preceded our policy thinking with research, we might find we have more success. So he uh, gave a very interesting example. On what New Zealand had done through its government on deciding that it would outlaw the inclusion of folic acid in bread because there had been a huge uproar that folic acid causes cancer. And the government actually passed a law to outlaw folic acid. He thought that at that time, science advice given to the government was wrong. He says this was indicative of the fact that the science community had failed to properly communicate to the public on the issue. And what they had caused was a huge fear in the public of falling acid. And so the public reaction compelled the government take a very problematic policy and decision. What I learned from this public engagement is that science informs advice, but it doesn't make policy. There are also different audiences for scientific advice, but the science community tends to focus on offering advice at a national level, and very, very rarely at the local government level. And there are different types of science advice. There might be technical advice, there might be regulatory advice, there may be formal, informal advice, and there might be advice in a context of emergency. All of these would be vastly different. In South Africa, we have a number of institutions that play a key role in responding to our scientific advice needs. One of the institutions producing evidence-based advice is the Academy of Sciences of South Africa. And I want to say to the distinguished assessments that if we don't have a strong Academy of Sciences, it's very difficult to root science. This academy provides evidence-based reports that address a diverse range of topics, from the role of genetically modified organisms in agriculture in Africa, to the emerging and little studied threat of drug-resistant tuberculosis, as well as strategies for the development of low carbon cities, or the prevention of a tobacco epidemic in Africa. Another advisory body is the National Advisory Council on Innovation, which is an institution established to provide policy advice to the Minister of Science and Technology and through that ministry to the cabinet. It is independent of government, and that always gets us. And it works through standing committees and task teams comprising of experts drawn from universities, science councils, <coughs> and business. We also have our public research councils, 
such as the Human Sciences Research Council, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Medical Research Council, and the Agricultural Research Council. They all contribute to generating scientific advice that may guide policy. I believe that evidence-based advice, as Professor Juma advised us, is important to sustaining science-based development in Africa. Consider health. We promote health sciences because we need to improve the quality of life here on our continent. African countries are beginning to be at the forefront of global scientific discovery as can be seen by the pioneering work being done by scientists in areas such as microbial science to prevent HIV infection, as well as drug and vaccine development for malaria and tuberculosis. This growth of pioneering work is shown by the full participation, including as funding partners and by South Africa and 14 other African countries in the European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. So, what might President Trump suggest we should do as African governments, institutions, to achieve the goals of our science and technology innovation? strategy for Africa, as well as our AU Agenda 2063. <coughs> what might he advise us to invest in? To begin catching up and create real opportunities for robust research and innovation. We are one of the countries that is a champion of the new science, technology, and innovation strategy for Africa, which was adopted by our leaders at the July 2014 African Union Assembly. The strategy focuses on our continent science, technology, and innovation investment in six socioeconomic benefit areas. First, eradicating hunger and ensuring food security on the continent. Two, preventing and controlling disease and ensuring human welfare in Africa. Three, improving intra African through investing in physical and digital infrastructure. Four, protecting Africa's natural resources. Five, building up communities, addressing aspects such as democratization, urbanization, and conflict resolution. And six, creating wealth for Africa. This is our agenda. This is what we've got to achieve. Science is also at the heart of the AU's Agenda 2063. Very little will come of this plan unless, unless each African country adopts a policy <coughs> of science-led development and puts an efficient <coughs> government department in place to pursue it. Only then will our grand plans be able to leverage private and philanthropic philanthropic participation, such as the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa, an initiative of the African Academy of Sciences and the new partnership for Africa's development. I might say, Vice Chancellor, that actually funding is not the problem. Getting to know what's out there and accessing it is the challenge. <laughs> I, wish, uh, I wish to, to, to move toward conclusion by just focusing on four features that I believe are necessary to achieve the African science and innovation First, the president's kind to me again. <laughs> First, universities and researchers 
mean academic freedom and freedom of expression. <laughs> the output of research, in fact, I know the president already confirmed that this yes. is the output of researchers is valuable in evidence based decision making on science policy. And our councils that I referred to are playing a critical role in preparing independent, uh, independent reports that are key reference points for government and policy makers. Uh, but having said that, I, I must say uh, to our dear scientists that I find they produce really excellent reports. But what I struggled with was extracting policy advice. And I think we need to develop the talent of writing the reports in a manner that allows the policy makers to extract policy advice. Because, yeah, it's great to read about biomass, but what are you advising me to do after I've read the report? So I think that issue of how we articulate policy advice is quite important. Uh, nevertheless, uh, our science council certainly impact on the areas I've already made a, a reference to. Of course, science being science, the advice of science councils is not without controversy. That's where it becomes difficult for politicians. From time to time, this means we need to consult broadly to allow the public to comment on emerging policy or on the views of scientists. This sometimes makes the interaction between scientists and policymakers tense and challenging. Second, <laughs> Effective science policy needs international partnerships. Science and innovation in our country has benefited immensely from a well crafted and energetic international science diplomacy strategy. Our strategy supports individual researchers, institutions, and government in establishing well designed and impactful international. Such links have led to very productive interdisciplinary research outcomes and have also allowed policymakers to form associations that have multiplied access to resources in the form of access to research infrastructure and funding for collaborative teams. Third, policymakers must provide funding for high level development of graduates and support for both established and emerging researchers. Linked to this is the need for policymakers to have a concrete science agenda with key focus areas clearly articulated to scientists and formally funded by government. Four, four, <laughs> evaluation. Evaluation is extremely <laughs> important. Regular review and the existence of reliable and effective data gathering institutions that report regularly on the system and provide quality data that can be used to reform where reform is needed. Evaluation criteria must also include a focus on indicators of performance that measure research output. I'm, I'm a really horrible minister because when people come with reports to me, I ask them, how many PhDs do you want? How many masters? How many are women? How many publications in which journal are? Escape with general staff, we must be strict on evaluation. We must insist on performance. Africa has no time to waste.
Many of our countries on the continent do not have these uh, four features, not all of them, some, and they also tend to be quite isolated from international collaboration. We all need to strengthen our efforts at inclusion as we can no longer be satisfied with the inadequate innovation capacity of Africa. And I've got to say, comrades, that pity only lasts so long. Oh, sure. it, it can't be for life. We have to stand up. Prosperous African nations will be those with governments that create the right enabling environment for science and technology to flourish. Determining the best technology policy is relatively straightforward. But having the people ready to take advantage of resource-rich opportunities is the real challenge. What African governments have to do is to determine where their comparative advantage lies and then to exploit it on a national scale. Renewable energy, mobile technology, and the bioeconomy are sectors that we believe have massive potential. In South Africa, we tried first to pick winners. We started with an electric car and realized we can't compete with South Korea. We tried with a small scale nuclear reactor, we didn't succeed. Then we turned to geographic advantage and tried astronomy, and we picked the winner in radio astronomy. For us, we have a comparative advantage in knowledge and job. These are, I believe, some of the aspects Professor Chuma wants us to give attention to. He didn't devote his life to encouraging us to invest in research, in science, in technology, and innovation for us to move to make character of influence. He had a fundamental interest in Africa being transformed and understood our participation in science, technology, and innovation was the route to such development. So let's make these aspirations real. And it is, dear colleagues, eminently doable. I thank you very much.